everybody and welcome back to another DIROS modeling example. This screencast will be a walkthrough of running an unbalanced response analysis. This example is going to be based on the example chamotorf.rot example that ships with most distributions of DIROS. This is a large induction motor of some sort supported on fluid film bearings. And what we're going to do in this screencast is walk through reviewing the model, setting up the unbalances, running the analysis, and some post-processing. So let's go ahead, we'll get DIROBS started, and we'll jump right on into it. So when we start up DIROBS, you get this little screen that gets you a couple different options. The option we're going to select is Rotor for Rotor Dynamics, and that will start up the DIROBS Rotor code, and we're using version 18. All the other versions are, however, fairly simple. So let me drag this down to where we can see it in the screencast window. For those who haven't looked at DIROBS before, this is the opening screen for DIROBS. It has a set of menu bars up at the top that we use to basically do all the things we need to do. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to open up this mo model example, example rotor. It lives in the examples directory that is installed, as I said, with most distributions of DIROBS. So it's the CHA Motor F example. So we'll select that, we'll open it, and that's the example that we're going to be looking at. This example has a coupling on one end, uh, sort of a rotor section here in the middle that's the magnetic part of the machine. And this has been modeled primarily as mass. So we're adding a bunch of mass, same density as the shaft, but we're not really adding any stiffness. This is one way to model machines like motors and generators. It's sitting on fluid film bearings at each end, and those bearings are supported by flexible pedestals that model the real support flexibility effects that are present in the motor. As shipped, this model has one unbalance that is applied. So to get started, we'll go to the model data editor. We'll select model data editor. This brings up the data editor, which is where we do most all of our work, modeling work anyway, in DIROBS. Uh, the first tab that pops up is the units description tab. It tells you that this is a variable speed motor with a flexible support system. Uh, it's designed, apparently, for an operating speed range of 27 to 4140 RPM. We'll discover that may not be a really happy operating speed range for it. It has speed dependent coefficients. So there's some, some comments in here to help you remember what this rotor model is if you're coming back to it later. Something very important to notice is the system units. This particular model is built using consistent units. Uh, if you're a finite element person, you might be familiar with that. If you're not, Basically, it's up to the user, in this case, to make sure that all the units cancel out. So we can't be using uh, pounds mass, for example. I typically do most of my modeling either in consistent, en sorry, engineering English or engineering metric units, which is more like what we're typically used to. But this was done in consistent units. Second tab over is the material tab. We've defined one material, uh, a steel. And you'll notice that the mass density looks a little bit strange because this is not pounds mass units. This is consistent units. Next tab over is the shaft elements, or where the shaft elements were defined. And we talked a bit about this in the Jeff Cut example, but we can have a lot of flexibility in how we set up a model and define it uh, using the options available on this screen. The disks has one disk defined. And this is a rigid disk uh, with a mass to represent the coupling half mass. And again, we talked a little bit about this in the Jeffcott rotor example, and we'll talk about this maybe in some future examples as well as some of the options here that, again, let you model uh, things in a little bit more detail. The unbalanced tab, this is where the unbalance was defined. Something that you have to be very aware of when you're defining unbalances in DIROBS is that they are not applied to stations. So the unbalance is applied over here on station 13, it would appear. It is actually applied to the left end of element 13. If you look at the input here in the unbalance uh, input screen, you'll notice it's applied to element 13, sub-element 1, and we have a amplitude of 0 0.008 units uh, on the left end at an angle of 0. We also have the option to put uh, amplitude, a imbalance at the right end. Uh, this becomes very important if you're trying to put an unbalance at the left, end, or sorry, the right end of the shaft. So if you're trying to put an unbalance on station 19, 
you can't do that directly. You actually have to apply the unbalance to element 18 and put it on the right end of 18. So something to be a little bit careful about. And unbalances can be applied both with an amplitude and a phase angle. So each one can put a different phase angle. Phase angles are quite important when you're trying to excite modes. Uh, for example, if you're trying to excite a conical mode, which the motion at the ends of the shaft are out of phase, you would need to put them out of phase in this sc input screen. The bearings tab is where the bearings were defined. These are speed dependent bearings, so you'll notice that the coefficients vary with speed. Uh, they are also set uh, from, let's page over to the other one that we can see, so this is the second bearing. It goes from station 18 to station 21. Station 21 is a flexible support station, and we'll show you where that one is. Uh, it is a speed dependent bearing. One could also have probably done this using bearing coefficients from a data file, which is how you would connect diroves to the bearing code bperf. The supports were defined under the supports tab. Uh, there are two supports, support 1 at station 20, support number 2 at station 21. Something to be aware of with dirobes is that the support stations use the next available set of station numbers after the end of the shaft. Uh, you have to keep track of this yourself. It's not something that dirobes keeps track of for you. Uh, so you have to define your bearing to go from 18 to 21. 21 is the, is the pedestal support stiffness, sorry, the pedestal mass station. Uh, you can define the damping in two different ways. You could enter it directly as a damping coefficient. You can also enter it as a zeta or a damping factor, in which case you would enter a zeta damping factor in the boxes down here, and DIROBS will calculate what goes in that box uh, when you go previous or next back and forth. It'll calculate those for you. So that's our whole model. Um, another thing, a couple things to maybe be aware of here. Uh, let me go back to the unbalanced tab to kind of make this point. Uh, at the bottom of most of the screens in DIROBS, it tells you what units you're using. So if this was mass units, it would tell you that your uh, units you need to be putting here are appropriate for, for those. In this case, it's consistent units. The other thing to be aware of in DIROBS is that the help is very helpful. So if you click on help, you will bring up uh, context sensitive help that tells you how some of the things are defined and that can be extremely useful that can be accessed either by clicking help or by hitting F1 on most of the, most of these screens um, depending on which distribution of diodes you have what version of Windows you have you may have to enter uh, sorry download from from Microsoft a, a different help driver but it's well, well worth the, the pain of doing that. So that's where we've defined the unbalances, and the model has been defined. So that's kind of reviewing the model real quick. So we'll close this. We didn't make any changes, so we don't need to save anything. There's our model that we started with. The next thing we want to do is go to the analysis setup. So we're going to run a lateral vibration analysis. Uh, this is the screen that pops up. For, the lateral, for all your analyses, the lateral analyses. Uh, the first thing we do is select which type of analysis we want to run. The last one that was run on this model was a steady state synchronous response for linear systems, which is what we want. The first set of options here in this box up at the top, we want to generally almost always have checked rotary inertia, shear deformation, and gyroscopic effects on. Physically, they are real. Physically, they're there. Occasionally, you would check G sub Z, which is for vertical shafts to get the gravity acting on the on the gravi vertical shaft. The box that we're interested in for steady state response is down here, sort of in the middle. Uh, in this box, we set up a starting speed, an ending speed, a speed increment. Uh, as it ships, I think this is set to a 50 RPM increment. I've set it to 25 RPM because that uh, gives us a little bit better looking picture. Uh, which shaft you want to excite? You can have multiple shafts in your diarobes models. This one will be exciting shaft one. There is only one shaft. Uh, but if you had multiple shaft rotors, you could excite a specific shaft, or you could click the all synchronized shafts and excite all the unbalances that are on any shafts that are spinning at the same speed. We then can pick what effects we would like to look at. So in this case, we're going to look at the mass unbalance. 
We could also look at a constant unbalance, a shaft bow, a disc skew, and a misalignment, any combination of those. So once we've got the analysis set up, we'll run it. This will bring up a DOS box, a little black DOS box, where the analysis runs. Uh, on most computers, it runs pretty darn quick, uh, unless the model is awful enormous. All right, with our analysis completed, the next thing we want to do is post-process it. So we collect, click on the post-process options. We're going to be doing steady synchronous response. There are two different text options, one for if you're doing the pseudo nonlinear, one for the nonlinear, which is what we just ran. This brings up a uh, text summary file that has oodles and oodles of information, generally more than you want to look at, but if you wanted to have a table of the actual numbers, they're fairly easy to access there. There are four options for shaft displacement type plots. We'll look at a couple of those. There are two options for looking at either shaft response shape or orbits. There are three options for looking at support forces. And finally, one option for looking at element shears and moments. First thing that uh, we'll look at is the Bode plot. So this uh, is a plot of amplitude of response versus speed and phase versus uh, speed. And we get, for each station, we'll get Two, uh, two outputs. In this case, it defaults to X and Y, so vertical and horizontal response. Uh, we can see there's a critical speed at around 2225 RPM. And in the horizontal direction, which is the lower red line there, there's probably a split critical speed. And we'll sort of dig into that a little bit as we go. We can, from this thing, directly increment stations. So we can walk through the stations. So this is up to station 5. Uh, more commonly, we might want to look at a specific station, say we want to look at station 18, we can bring up this settings menu. It'll let us customize the labels, pick a specific station. We can also look at things relative. So now we're going to be looking at station 18, which is the center of the bearing, relative to the pedestal 21. It'll also let us rotate the probes. Most machinery does not have probes vertical and horizontal. They're actually at plus or minus 45 degrees, so we could do 45 and 135. There is an option to make this be the default, and I'll show you that in a moment. We can label on here an operating speed. Say we wanted to run this thing at 3600 RPM, so we'll have a reference line. We can label our amplification factors. I'll show you what that does. And a few other options down here that we can change to customize this plot. Uh, to kind of help either understand something or make a point to, to a customer. So when we do it, we get to the plot that looks something like this. We've now added a blue vertical line, which shows the operating speed, and we've labeled our peaks. Those, both those peaks have very large amplification factors. Uh, as I commented when we started this, I don't know that I would want to run this motor at 3600 RPM. Uh, it's going to be... Uh, ill-natured going through those two critical speeds. They're, they're rather sharp. So we could also, for example, from this one, if we wanted to look at the motion of, say, a foundation, say station 21, which is our pedestal, we could look at the pedestal motion. Um, and we see something like that. So you can look at different any station in the model you can look at a Bode plot from this option. We can also look at uh, the other op plot option that I use quite frequently is ellip uh, sorry is responses at multiple stations. This is a plot that will let us put uh, a number of different things on so we could look at the coupling, drive in bearing, kind of near mid span, opposite in bearing, we could again label it 3600 RPM to get a reference line if we wanted to. And that'll let us look at all those responses all together. And these are the major axis response. Uh, you actually have an option to change that. What you want to look at is major axis X or Y. I like to look at major axis. This is sort of the largest displacement anywhere on that orbit. From this plot, we can also look at different units. If we wanted to look at this in velocity or acceleration units, I use this sometimes to predict velocity or acceleration of supports, where we might have a velocity or acceleration transducer mounted. 
You can also look uh, different units, uh, different different scalings on the plots. Uh, if that became useful for for some reason to understand a little bit better. So that's responses at multiple stations and Bode plots. Another set of things that can be very, very useful is looking at the shaft response in 3D. Um, so this is what lets you figure out how is that shaft orbiting, uh, the whole entire shaft. Uh, it's most useful if you have the animation on. So this is how the shaft is orbiting or whirling at 2000 RPM. If we step this up to 2225 uh, or thereabouts, 2200, well, actually I can certainly see it right here at 2200, we can now see that indeed there is a horizontally dominated motion uh, just below the peak, which suggests that, yep, we do sort of have some kind of a at least weekly crit split critical speed. Uh, we can also tell diarobes to do a startup animation, so it'll go through kind of auto scale itself and step through all the speed points in the analysis. It'll go up and then down, and it'll just start going up and down for us so we can sort of see how that works. Sometimes this is a useful and, and informative way to watch it. Sometimes it's a little less interesting and a little bit more confusing. And again, you can you can change various things on that if you want to. Another option that we have available is to look at orbits. So we can look at an orbit plot for a specific station at a specific speed, or we can also animate a shut up, a, a start up or a shut down. Uh, sometimes this is kind of useful to understand what's going on. As I mentioned the final thing that sometimes very useful to us is looking at bearing transmitted forces. Uh, so we can look at bearing transmitted forces with this plot. Something you'll notice is it's possible to leave a bunch of windows open. Uh, it is also possible to go back to the analysis and run it for, say, a different speed range. If we just wanted to zoom in on, on a speed range around that critical, we could run it. And we could then just simply refresh our plots. And they may or may not refresh on their own. And we can now take advantage of whatever customization we did to those plots without having to completely redraw the plot. Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, kind of what you can do with unbalanced response. Uh, one thing, other thing I wanted to show you is under the preferences settings, under the post-processor graph settings, is where you can change the default probe orientation. So if all the, the machines and things you're looking at have probes at uh, 30, uh, plus or minus 45 degrees, you can actually define this to always do that. Uh, if you wanted to always plot things out with the label saying inches on it, you can actually change your bloaty plot amplitudes to say inches or mils or whatever. Oops, I can't type. Inches or mils or whatever you have. But you have to be careful with that because if you run something in metric units, it will use that default label. So be cautious with that, but it, there are a lot of customization things that you can do uh, from from this this preferences setting menu. So that's a quick look at how to run unbalanced response, uh, how to set it up, and hopefully that was helpful. Thanks for watching.